Let's begin in Dubai, sometime around the discovery of oil in 1966, and before the import-export, boxy-shouldered swagger of the 1980s. It's probably the early 70s, during or shortly after the oil, Arab oil embargo of 1973-4. This image of Dubai is one of sleepy, slightly oily glamour, old Bedouins and boats. Mirrored sunglasses and the earliest mirrored buildings, tinted copper, steel blue or sage, the kind you see in Dubai before and after photos. Sheikh Rashid bin Said al Maktoum, who is the founding ruler of Dubai, says, My grandfather rode a camel, my father rode a camel, I drive a Mercedes, my son drives a Land Rover, and his son will drive a Land Rover, but his son will ride a camel. It's a quote that has see since been repeated so often that its origins have become murky, but its connotations remain fixed. Sheikh Rashid is wary of the sudden influx of oil wealth. He knows it can last forever, that it's risky to depend on oil, that Dubai's economy must be radically diversified if it's to survive into the next century. Like his son, the current ruler and prime minister, Sheikh uh, Mohammed, he's a visionary. He sees the future and then brings it into being, or so the comparison show photos show. So this is Dubai in 1990. Um, it's its main highway. Um, so you have this image of Dubai, like the highway, snaking through empty sand and coastal scrub. And then we're going to see a match shot just uh, 15 years later in 2005, which is showing its current receiving line of skyscrapers. Um, this is Dubai Creek, uh, which you can think of. It. It's a saltwater inlet that contributed to its history as a trading entrepot scattered with wooden dows and lined with even more skyscrapers. Uh, so that's once, oops, sorry. So, um, so this is the creek um, basically in the 60s. Uh, generally, you'll see it with a lot more buildings now. Um, and this is the Burj Khalifa, which is currently the world's tallest building, um, dwarfing all the other very tall buildings at its base. Uh, depicted alone, because what could compare? The thing about this genre of before and after photos is that they usually describe an external, often calamitous, out of control human event. Here is the very green forest, and here it is decimated by the tsunami. Here is the same devastation of a once prosperous city after the fire, the tornado, the hurricane, or the flood. But in Dubai's case, there's never an ex event except Dubai. Here is the city before and after itself, and also during the ongoing process of its own beginning. Um, this is Dubai Frame, which is a large public mon monument there, which really um, makes very literal how the Syrian want city wants to flame, frame itself. One side, you look and you see the new Dubai. The other side, you look and see the creek. Um, it's also worth taking a moment here to consider the country's demographics. Um, people like to say over there's, there's over 200 nationalities, has the highest ratio of citizens to temporary residents in the world, something between 11 and 20 percent, depending on who you ask. And this is the country as a whole. In Dubai, it's generally closer to 5 percent are citizens of the country. All of this means that Emirati identity is fraught. It's understood as something that's under attack from these forces of rapid development and something to be preserved at all costs. Another thing that will load or not. <laughs> so Emirati identity tends to be articulated in one of two ways. Firstly, it's predicated on cultural heritage and the hardship of desert life, which wasn't so far off. Um, so boat building, either for trade or for piracy, weaving, nomadism, hunting, falconry, and pearl diving despite the latter, again, largely being done by slaves, but this is a history that gets effaced. Um, secondly, Emirati identity tends to be defined by what it's not. And it's important to note how this differs from the rising tide of xenophobia you're seeing somewhere like Europe or the US. All of these non-citizens in the country aren't seen as a threat so much as an affirmation of Emirati identity. Um, and the scholarship of anthropologist Neha Vora is a great resource for more on this. Um, Dubaiization, as it's called in architecture, um, which following the work of Yashir al Shastawi and Fadi Shaya, is understood as a particular juxtaposition of spectacular skyscrapers against desert on one side, water on the other, and of course, a rapid fire launch into first world comforts. And it's a very first uh, 21st century dream akin to the desire, maybe in the last few centuries, of being crowned the 
Paris of the East. Um, we have examples of cities like Casablanca and Morocco competing to be crowned Dubai, the Nile Dubai of Africa. Um, similarly, Emiratiness, which is the citizen identity, is defined in juxtaposition to the South Asian or Southeast Asians that make up so much of the population. Other historical borders and basically ethnic borders, which is of Arabness, of being African, of being Iranian, are far blurrier. Um, so, like everything else in the city, this is a very contingent model of nationalism that jettisons any gene genealogical or historical fixity in favor of instrumentalizing different and sometimes competing narratives depending on the prevailing geopolitical currents. Um, centuries of trade with India right now are in thanks to Modi, plus an aggressive south, soft power push into the South Asian art scene. So you're seeing a lot of new biennials and other events um, opening in India and Pakistan, and then Bangladesh less, so it's self-funded more. But um, a lot of these other events are basically with money, explicitly government money, uh, from the Gulf as a mode of basically extending its reach in a different way. Um, there obviously, there used to be very strong links. There still are strong links with Iran, but um, because of the wars they're currently fighting, or I wouldn't say they're fighting, um, in Syria and Yemen, Iran is kind of out. And you see that uh, that's, that's something that has an effect with, let's say, the Iranian galleries, Iranian artists, just the ability. And this is something that, you know, you might have a gallery in Dubai, but you might not be allowed to enter the next year. It keeps moving. Um, so all of that was kind of preamble um, to set up. I want to talk about some of the early Emirati conceptualists who responded to these uh, developments in one of two ways. Um, the first way was to take all of this mass-produced plasticky flotsam that flooded the city very quickly and use it as a material for their works. Um, the beginning stages of what I've come to think of as a uniquely uh, gulfy petromateriality, and by that I mean works using this kind of very plastic, uh, oil-derived, very post-oil work. Um, so if you consider Hassan Sharif, who's most often dubbed the father or grandfather of contemporary art in the UAE, although it's a label he himself rejected. Um, so these are some of his early works after returning from art school in the UK in the 1970s. And so when talking about the history of contemporary art, this is very new. It's very recent, just the last couple of decades. There was, of course, art around, but it was either you know, the Arab modernism of the region or kind of nice painting shows. Um, so. Um, after returning from art school, he began experimenting with Lux's style performances. He would count cars, he would throw rocks, um, jump in the desert, maybe draw on walls. And the most interesting thing, perhaps, about these works today is the, when you actually, when you look at them today, is an awareness that in a place like Dubai, um, expressions and gestures of mobility remain still among the most radical things that you can do. Um, so these are some more of his works. And he's today probably best known for, he died recently, I think 2016, 17. Um, he's best known for these assemblage style sculptures which he began producing in the 1990s, which are compromised of things like rubber flip flops, cheap plastic household goods, snack packaging, tools, electronic refuse, and assorted industrial bric-a-brac. He intended them as critiques of the rampant commercialization that swept the UAE following the oil boom, oil boom, sorry, um, but these works read today as a kind of material archaeology of the country. Um, and so these are some more of his works. Um, um, and then another tendency in these early Emirati artists, who were primarily men, um, that's changed quite radically now, um, but at the time, no. Um, so another tendency is exemplified by another Emirati artist called Abdullah Saadi, whose works emphasize the way of life that was so quickly being erased, as well as his lived experience of rural life, again, something that was being lost to the growth of these cities. Um, and it's worth contrasting his practice to a younger generation of artists from the Gulf, particularly in places like Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, who make work, or tend, have tended now to make work featuring a rather romanticized, um, almost like the Agraba of Aladdin or Lawrence of Arabia or Wilfried uh, Thesiger type subject matter. 
And it's both a really interesting feedback loop and also exemplifies the temporal, cultural, and historical disconnect that characterizes a lot of young artists working today. And to be clear, this is, I think I see this more as a feature and not necessarily a bug, um, because Dubai is very much um, built on a cycle of erasure and then erasure and erasure, uh, disconnect with his history, like all of this stuff is maybe archived, but it's the narrative of the city is very much set up that like, here's a break point and here's another. Um, we can also understand this kind of Bedouin nostalgic current, um, which is also heavily present in the artists around the edge of Arabia, as symptomatic of Saudi money's increasing influence. Today we have, which you've probably heard about, the more controversial MISC Institute, um, but maybe more quietly you have the Jamil Foundation, which recently inaugurated Dubai's first contemporary art museum on the Old Creek. Um, and... Here, just want to, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say these are necessarily representative, but you do see, even I think in maybe some of the more interesting artists working today, you do see this kind of take up again of this kind of imagery. Um, so these are, and I find these images particularly interesting because they're taken at exactly the same place, um, a falcon hospital, which is like a falcon vet in Abu Dhabi in the capital city. Um, these green ones are by an artist, uh, Raja Khaled, who's Pakistani. Um, and the ones that you'll see a bit in a second are from another artist who's Emirati called uh, Farah al Qasimi, done basically very shortly afterwards. Um, and this is something you might, I think maybe there has been a criticism is that you'll see certain kinds, certain groups of artists, um, non-national artists doing something, and then very quickly afterwards you'll see the Emirati artists doing a very similar thing and maybe being supported on an international stage and. Uh, that's a dynamic. That's a dynamic of Dubai as a city, but it's something that plays out also in its art scene. Um, okay, so that's a really slow fade. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, really, and the rise of Saudi, especially now, it could really be this whole other talk. But one other thing that's interesting um, here, especially with the choice of opening this museum on the creek, which is not really the place of development in the city, or hasn't been historically, um, is that you're, you're seeing this kind of very heavy emphasis, a return to this creek uh, as a heart of the city, and a new focus of development. Um, and I think this is something you're seeing as a maybe indicative of a broader look towards, towards the water that I mentioned uh, initially, the legacies of the Arab slave trade. Um, which are not necessarily now uh, suppressed so much as dismissed as low or vernacular culture. Uh, and of course, the UAE is a heavily racialized um, place. So you have something where even within, someone, um, within people who are citizens, you'll have a thing where if someone has tribal lineage, they are, have different access than someone who has Iranian lineage and who has uh, East African lineage. Um, so all of these things, the, I guess, water-based things have become increasingly prominent sources of material for artists, um, and not just those based in the UAE or the Gulf, but beyond, uh, around the rim of the Indian Ocean, and you see this very much in biennials like Sharjah and Kochi, and even in Jakarta and Yogyakarta. Um, and this image in particular, some of you, if you went to last uh, Sharjah biennial might have seen, was a performance uh, called Land of Zanj, which explicitly dealt with this kind of uh, history of slavery. Um, so both the Emirati artists that I mentioned earlier, um, Hassan Sharif and Abdullah Saadi, are members of what have come to be called the Five, which is a term that refers to a group of Emirati conceptualists who are, who are associated with the Emirati Fine Arts Society uh, in 1980, and later what came to be called the Flying House Collective. And this is again a process of like history or myth making as it's convenient. All of these artists when they were working at the time didn't receive this kind of massive push, massive amounts of money, government support, but it's now that the UAE has, or Dubai in particular, has this kind of commercial scene, it becomes convenient to have a historical lineage. Um, and one other artist that I want to just bring up briefly whose work I really like is um, Again, one of the five, and his name is Muhammad Ab Ahmed Ibrahim. Uh, his work is very intimately connected with his home, which is a small coastal enclave called Khorfakan, um, 
on the UAE's other coast, so not where most of the cities are. Um, and he very much makes use of found natural materials like palm leaves, mud, clay, sand, uh, shells and rocks, um, and incorporates them into these very colorful paper mache sculptures, some of which you see here. Um, so, of course, when we speak of contemporary art today in the UAE, it includes the five who are mostly still living, um, but it also kind of collapses this generation with a number of much younger artists, many of whom are equally from the UAE. In a manner that I am, for example, I have an Indian passport, but grew up in Dubai, and it's, there's, that's the kind of tension that you'll see with most of the residents um, there. So many of these young artists working to, younger artists working today are from the UAE, but have passports from other countries. Um, the next few, I'm not really going to talk about her practice necessarily, I think, but the next few series of images are from the young Emirati artist I mentioned earlier, uh, Farah al-Qasimi. Um, and her photographs, I think, really capture a very clashy, almost dialectical multiculturalism that characterizes the city today. So, um, I think that this demographic mix that you see in the city is probably the most uh, interesting thing about Dubai. It's not particularly nice multiculturalism. Um, it's very often aggressive. Um, and now you have a lot of multinational, con multinational countries who have to abide by the laws of their home countries, but racism uh, is extremely structural, structurally um, entrenched. You'll have a thing where a job ad will say, like, you should be, let's say, a Filipino woman between this age, you know, and all of these stuff, all this stuff is totally legal and still exists in the way. Um, but I think the most interesting thing part about the UE's very recent development, uh, it's a young country only formed uh, or brought together as a country in 1971, is that it was, for most of its history, really too um, peripheral to ever be colonized. You know, it had some security agreements with the other, let's say the Ottomans claimed it, but kind of ignored it. The British, like, had an airport there. But what it means is that um, the area largely bypassed colonialism, and that's very different from everywhere else in the region, all the other work that tends to be shown in Dubai. The UE itself doesn't, um, oh, just, doesn't really have this uh, hangover. Um, so, it, so you don't have this colonial hangover, and by extension, you also don't have the financial relationships, um, which you see a lot of um, other places in the world where a lot of the arts funding comes from the former colonial overlord just because it didn't exist, and the UE has its own money. Um, what this means is that this is a place uh, kind of unlike, I think maybe in earlier decades, there was an ideological dream of the South-South, you know, of this kind of global Southern solidarity. Um, and the UAE is interesting in that it's a place that's post-Western, not because of any ideology, but just because it makes financial sense, you know, to be friends with the Chinese or to make agreements with, let's say, West African industrialists. The other part of this is because it didn't necessarily receive other people's um, laws or, it, I mean, it took its laws in part from the British, but um, the thing about the UAE kind of fun making up as it went along almost in the last uh, few decades is that it's a place that's very post nation state, but it's also post rights. Um, and it's not in a positive way, but this is, I think, one way that you can see the UAE as very futurist, because of, of course, like other countries, they might have different histories, but are tending to go this way. Um, and so when we talk about multiculturalism, we tend to talk of two models. Um, both of them tend to be food-based. Uh, one might be the French style of fondue, the melting pot. You know, everything gets subsumed under the state. Um, everything gets assimilated. Um, and it's a kind of, you get, you, here you tend to get a maybe feel-good liberal utopianism. It's the same kind that might embrace the optics of diversity, but not any kind of structural change or racial justice. Um, and another version that you might get is um, a flattening, homogenizing impulse uh, and all the cultural erasure of them. I'm oh, sorry. So in instead of this kind of flattening impulse, you have the idea of the mixing bowl, the toss salad. Everyone gets along, coexists, maintains their heritage, and Canada's mosaic 
at least as they see it, is a good example of this. Um, the problem with all of these concepts, and the thing about the UE in, in general, is that because it's so new and it just works in a different way, you don't really have the vocabulary to talk about it in the same way. And the problem with all of these concepts is that they assume immigration and naturalization, which don't, of course, exist there. Um, so you can be born there, but that's, you're still going to have a visa for life until you retire, or, and then you get kicked out of the country, essentially. Um, so the UAE has a kind of nat national cultural identity, uh, which is very different from the, I guess, the citizen identity. Um, but the cultural identity is formed additively. Um, it accumulates and intermixes over generations. Um, that doesn't work in the UAE which is being characterized by the transients of its populations, the Bedouins, the sailors, the expat and migrants workers, since its earlier, earliest days. Um, so what I think is maybe the best model um, to think about the UAE as a population is the idea of the hot pot or the shabu shabu or steamboat, it's called different things, different places. Um, it's something that uh, originates, they say, in Mongolia and it's born out of the condition of always being transitory. So you had this sense of Mongol warriors in Kublai Khan's time, um, when, where the go governing logic was to ride fast, pack light. They would stop, you know, cook something in a helmet, um, which is why you get the very thinly shaved meat there, um, and to cook faster and then move on. And the UAE works in the same way, both uh, both its, both its general culture and specifically its art scene. Um, it's kind of this similar, I don't know if, if hot pot's common here, but um, the idea is that something might be in the broth only for 30 seconds or other people might be a few years, um, some people decades. Um, the most important thing is whatever goes in must come out. Uh, right, that video for some reason is working. So when thinking about Dubai's cultural fabric, I also like to think of the ceramic mending technique of kintsugi, which involves uh, repairing broken vessels with lacquer mixed with gold or other precious metals. Instead of being hidden, seams are highlighted and the object's history is made visible. The pottery is said to be all the more beautiful for its imperfections. Um, what's interesting about this is that there's also a kind of cultural marking a very gilded territorial pissing at play. Once something is restored in this style, a recognizably Korean or Chinese or Vietnamese object is forever linked to a specifically Japanese aesthetic tradition. Um, Dubai as a city enacts a kind of urban kintsugi, cobbling together its identity from the myriad cultures that thrive in the city, even as the seams, which reflect its deep racial and economic stratification, remain eminently visible. On a more intimate level, non-citizen artists enact a similar hot pot or kintsugi-like practice, building up their visual languages from fragments of multiple cultures and in the process, claiming them as their own. One tendency that you will see, and this extends to Gulf artists more broadly, is unfortunately to treat predominantly South Asian and Southeast Asian workers as a kind of plastic raw material, same as palm trees or mud or sand um, to be used in their art. Um, and of course, the dynamics are very different when this is done by, let's say, a Kuwaiti, like this is what we're seeing right now, is um, Munir al Qadri's Ramadan soaps, um, and done by an Indian artist like Vikram Devecha, which I'll talk about in a second. So um, Vikram Devecha is now based between uh, Dubai and New York. I think he's finishing up an MFA there. Um, um, but he has this idea of what he calls collaboration, which I think I would use in scare quotes. Um, collaboration is central to his practice. He employs, quite literally, a transaction gardeners, sweepers, masons, and other municipal workers who earn a very nominal fee to produce his pieces. Um, importantly, he doesn't just outsource. He demarcates the conceptual frame for peace, but most aesthetic decisions are left to the workers. Um, so this piece, for example, which is called De Degenerative Disarrangement, um, it grew out of the artist noticing scrambling patterns, just like this on city sidewalks, after bricks that used to be once painted with the crosswalk diagonals were rearranged very fast uh, following repairs. 
So, and this is a commission piece in the courtyard of a traditional home in one of the historic districts. Um, he asks the workers to lay similarly painted tiles to their liking, um, but working under the usual strict time constraints for such a job. Um, so you have this kind of very glitchy, permanent floor installation. Uh, another piece kind of in this vein is um, he asked tile workers to form these precariously bound sculptural piles uh, from discarded underpass tiles. And again, if you've been in the city, you might have seen these. They're highway murals, um, usually depict the most banal of nationalist imagery. You see sand dunes, palm trees, camels, boats, uh, the word Dubai in Arabic just repeated over and over. We purposed here, and again, these workers would all generally be South Asian. The tiles come to depict, resemble a kind of parallel city within the city, always on the brink of collapse. But there is a danger in treating workers as the city's overseers do, as raw material, to be ferried about and used before being discarded. The power differentials are inescapable in Devech's practice, and his work always teeters on the precipice of instrumentalizing his collaborators. At the same time, there's a quiet and maybe admirably non-flashy resistance in the way that the artist tries to reconnect workers with the creative side of their own labor, as in this piece um, for which gardeners were asked to carve hedges into a public plaza where they usually maintain in whatever patterns they wanted. So Devech's wall texts that accompany these kinds of works um, Name all of his workers as collaborators, um, even as he remains like the Sheikh of Dubai, the artist and the architect. Um, and this is something that you really see with a lot of artists working today is almost a parrot, not a, not a parroting, but really a reiterating of the way that the rulers of the city move it around. Um, like there's, I, I think there's a, maybe a running joke that kind of no matter how fast the artists work, they can't keep up with the city and with the Sheikh's pace of development. Um, and if all of this means that the artists end up being conscripted into being cultural investors for the brand, um, whether they want to or not, a kind of soft power army, that's also not an accident. Um, so one thing that's important to remember is unlike the, the soap opera with the uh, Filipino women imposed on you saw earlier, Devecha is able to access his collaborators, as he calls them, precisely because of his gender um, and his Indian identity. And although his um, projects are born of an extended, uh, sorry, extended engagement with Dubai's bureaucratic apparatus, this position within the social hierarchy, a very privileged one, does allow him to engage with his fellow desis or South Asian expats. Um, in a way that few other artists are available, are able or willing to do. Um, these are his collaborators. So in this, his practice makes visible not only Dubai's marginalized workers, but also the informal networks of South Asian solidarity that are usually invisible to people from other backgrounds. And I think this is, this and artists like this are probably a much more interesting way and I think valuable way to consider labor when it's done or labor or the the business of working, as it were, in the UE, um, as compared to some of the other things that you might see. Uh, so what all the photos I've shown don't really relay is the olfactory turn of the city. Uh, the acrid tang of petrol mixed in with the rounded freon edges of air-conditioned interiors, the funny and nosmic wooliness of dust, the slightly saline air that comes from rarely being that far from the coast, the city is built very linearly in that way and all the usual fried food and city runoff smells. One thing that's very prominent also is these kind, this musky smell of oud, which is a smoky aromatic resin, um, which, kind of, which is produced by the agarwood tree to ward off invasive creatures or fungi. Uh, oud very much is the smell of power, of having a golf passport, of being a citizen, of having a blood and soil connection. Um, as do documented in what's called the Khulasat al-Qaid, or family book, which, convert, which is actually where nationality is located, not in the actual passport. You had a situation, um, and again, this is a very loose federation, but you had a situation where up until 2009, basically, until the financial crash, each emirate would issue its own passports, um, 
but the passport didn't confer nationality. It was having that plus having this document. Uh, and now since basically Abu Dhabi only has the money, they issue the passports. So it's become, I guess, more regular in that way. Um, so, let me. so this olfactory expression of power is a key theme in the work of Pakistani artist Raja Khaled, who was, you saw earlier, with one of those Falcon works. She was born in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, but has spent most of her life in Dubai. Um, most of her older projects, many of her older projects, incorporate synthetic versions of oud, uh, which are, and synthetic oud is generally more accessible to the population. Real oud is super expensive. Um, so the synthetic oud are fragrant chem chemicals she has displayed in fairly austere seal canisters and plinths, uh, such as here. Sometimes they're, oops infused into bars of scented soap and disseminated into the gallery using an industrial strength wool mounted diffuser. In this last piece, um, which you'll see in the next slide, she includes a description. She includes a framed copy of a US patent application for the scent, which hangs on the wall next to the diffuser. And the form includes a description of the balsamic odor with sandalwood ambergris tonalities. Um, Oud has also become increasingly popular with Western luxury fragrance bands, um, and she does litter work, has done a lot with Tom Ford especially, who use and often use this to add an exotic note to certain perfumes. Um, in the Gulf states, uh, where Oud is very much linked to traditional cultural practices, and it's really the one thing that endures when all of the kind of falcons and palm trees and that kind of imagery doesn't, um, you'll oft often find it filling hotel lobbies, office buildings, and malls, as if to secure the semblance of an identity for these um, new public spaces, which are otherwise fairly um, empty of anything. So in Khalid's work, scent becomes this very a complex cultural signifier, and she offers commentary on the commodified heritages and constructed authenticity that you'll see uh, elsewhere in the city. You might also compare her work, I haven't really talked about them here, but to the collective GCC who aren't from the UAE, but from other Gulf states who I think behave much more in the manner of the state, creating in a mimetic way, but in a way that also reproduces these power differentials, these very bureaucratic uh, environments and of power. Um, so in this installation, which I think was in Switzerland, um, the sillage of the Oud, it parallels the diffusion of brand Dubai on an international stage. The work includes a rack of Real Madrid soccer jerseys with the ubiquitous um, Emirates logo emblazoned across the front. The shirts are embedded with micro capsules containing Oud fragrance, which is released as the fabric moves. Um, and this installation in Switzerland was accompanied by a photograph of an Emirates airplane in flight. And it's difficult not to think of this image as depicting cloud seeding, which is one way that they're creating artificial rain right now, raining down this fine oud scented mist on everything in its flight path. Um, Khaled's work with oud is part of her broader conceptual concern uh, with parallels between historic European colonialism and the globalized economy of the contemporary Gulf. Uh, for these prints, she photographed two plates from a 19th century German encyclopedia, which depicted tropical plants from around the world, which had been brought together to study in a Berlin greenhouse. Um, the plants, at least then, appear to thrive in the artificial climate controlled space. Um, and displayed in Dubai, where most food is imported in the desert landscape blooms thanks to entirely desalinated seawater. There's no rain, so all water is from the sea, and by extension, very expensive. Um, they, these archival images select, suggest a kind of vegetal blueprint for how exotic flora has come to thrive in this arid, air-conditioned city. And this is an installation from a little bit later. Um, oops. I fortunately couldn't find very good images for the series, which was actually, I think, only shown in Austria at, uh, at I forget its name, a Tyrolean. Uh, art institution. Um, but this is another series, Politics of Comfort, which addresses an older fashion for worldly interiors in 19th century Europe. 
Um, this installation, in particular Turkish Corner, uh, includes an ornamental plant and a pile of upholstery panels, the lat latter which are pre-cut for the low flat cushions used in Ottoman style seating, which you also see used in the UAE. These objects are presented as raw materials for the interior decorating trend of the Oriental Salon, where exotic Eastern objects, Persian carpets, Chinese lacquered furniture, and Japanese fans would be di um, displayed. Relegating these alien cultures to a specific room or corner ensured that they didn't clash with the rest of the otherwise Europeanized uh, decor. And I think I was, I'm going to skip past some things for time. Um, so even while making a reference to 19th and 20th century Europe, the Politics of Comfort series gestures towards Dubai's embrace of the same strategies in the present, which is realized on a huge urban scale. Um, as you might be su unsurprised, there's obviously a lot of spatial segregation as well in the city. Um, so the city's hotpot brand of cosmopolitanism is predicated not on living with other cultures, but really in being able to readily consume them at your convenience. Um, so one really big example of this will be uh, the real estate mega project called Falcon City of Wonders, which will feature to scale replicas of things like the Giza pyramids, the Eiffel Tower and the Taj Mahal. Um, and in some cases, they'll be bigger than the originals. There's also going to be at some point the Mall of the World, where you'll find sealed environments replicating places like Oxford Street, which I believe is going to have snow, because um, these are under a climate dome, and Times Square. Uh, so we might see this really as a continuation, and which is the interesting thing, Dubai was never colonized, but is now essentially acting in the way that other countries or empires did in the prior centuries. Um, the way Dubai works is to say, all of these things are explicitly not us, but now we have made them ours. Um, earlier, I touched touch on the changing face of Emirati national identity. Um, since the introduction of mandatory national service um, for men and coming out shortly after Qatar's own uh, conscription. So this is the kind of aesthetics you see. This is a very new thing. Like They didn't go to war before, but you can see what they're doing in Yemen uh, as part of Saudis. I don't know what campaign, and UAE is also doing this on their own. Um, this is this is something that you see that has really, really changed the culture, the feeling of being in the city. It's very tense. It's very militarized, but you also see this, and again, this um, comes out in the Emirati artists. Whereas Emiratiness was used to be very much predicated on national, you know, on the heritage, on the falcons, on the weaving, these kinds of things, which was reflected in the art. Um, right now, Emirati, right now it's very much um, not about an identification with the land, you know, with the soil, but with the state itself, with moving into, if the non-citizen artists move into the sea, um, the Emiratis are very much trying to move into the air, and maybe at risk of anecdata. I remember talking to an Emirati friend who would characterize his, spend his time doing national service as one of nation building, where they're really trying to erase these family and emirate specific identities, because again, it is a loose federation they're trying to stitch into a tighter country. Um, he saw the, basically the army service as um, an identification with the national project in an attempt to more subtly fuse together the um, federation. Another thing that has shifted Dubai's new projected image of its, itself is, so another thing that has shifted is the way Dubai now sees itself. And it's very much a logic of why be content with this kind of space age aesthetics and skirts architecture, you know, with famous architects and comparisons with the Martian landscape um, when you can literally go to space, uh, take up the baitin of Muslim cosmology and then you might see this as a different kind of planetary thinking. It's very much like, we navigated by the stars, now we're going to go to the stars. Um, so when the UAE, when Dubai rather, hosts the World Expo next year, which is potentially featuring Elon Musk's Hyperloop, um, UAE will also launch a probe to Mars. It's going to be the first uh, foray into space from any Arab or predominantly Muslim country. And it's going to arrive in 2021 in time for the 50th anniversary 
of the country's funding with all of the jingoism and nationalistic fervor that this involves. Um, the team behind the Mars mission will, very unusually for the country, be 100% Emirati, with a significant assist from South Korean expertise. Um, as the country shifts more broadly to being less reliant on foreign knowledge and skills, um, just their physical labor, the Mars mission feels like a pilot program in more ways than one. So really, you can see the Mars mission as a very full-throated embrace of Gulf futurism, which is maybe exemplified by the work of writer, filmmaker, and artist Sofia Maria, whose practice really captures a texture of Gulf life a little older, like in the 90s. Um, you might describe this as really a, a time of um, really oppressive heat, coupled with, in a place like Qatar, where she grew up, gender segregation, which meant that the life was largely lived in air-conditioned spaces and mediated by an increasingly smaller series of screens. So you had TV showing satellite programs late at night. Video game consoles where the simulations of Desert Strike indefinitely extended the Gulf War. You had veils, you had cell phones, rampant consumerism, religion, and violence all rolled up into one. Looking at it now, and this is work that was made not that long ago, but looking at it now, the most remarkable thing about that period um, is how dated, how already retro it feels. The city has moved on, the, the region as well. It's important to remember as well that Gulf futurism was a response not only to the heavily mediated uh, image of war, but also to ecological catastrophe, namely the unforgettable burning of Kuwaiti oil fields, uh, these acrid black plumes of smoke that ranged for several months in the, in like 1991. And of course, it's a tactic that's been used since uh, in Iraq. Um, but this really, this kind of, just the oil fields being on fire is an event that really haunts the psyches of other artists of this generation in their mid to late 30s, like Devecha and Khalid, who I talked about. But it's something that you'll see is notably absent in the work of younger artists like Farah Qasmi, who had all those um, photographs. The, um, I think we're getting, how are we doing for time? Are we... um, one thing I do want to say about the uh, Mars mission, which is interesting, it's, a hu it's uh, very much about power, but ostensibly it's also about environmental concerns. Um, their research goals are primarily weather-based to look at uh, climate dynamics, the effects of surface weather upon the atmosphere, global weather tracking, atmospheric escape. The framing is very much of um, Emirati excellence, but the point of the mission is supposed to be as a counter to global warming. Um, this is not in the Gulf. This is, I th believe, in Siberia, um, a case caused of methane bubbles rising up under the ground, which makes it uh, spongy in this way. But I really think of this video as an example of the feeling, maybe the feeling of this, the, this kind of, when the ground becomes not solid anymore, when things become spongy. Um, and one thing you are seeing in the UAE also is uh, they're doing a lot of stuff, trying to do a lot of stuff on Mars, but they're, they've also spent the last few decades quite literally trying to manipulate the weather to make it rain. So cloud seeding is fairly common and has been for a while, but one new thing they are using, and it's the kind of thing where they're like, we're using this thing, no we're not, um, when it's successful, if it's not, they say they're not using it. Something called desert ionizers, which ostensibly sends some kind of electrical, I don't know how it works exactly, sends an electrical current, but both of these are ways of um, making it rain. But the thing, about, the thing about when the rain is artificially created is that uh, you feel a very different, it's a very different kind of rain. Um, I feel. You, so you don't really get a lot of cloud cover there, but um, these artificial storms are like very heavy on lightning. They feel different, um, threatening, and they're a lot more uh, voluminous than maybe they used to be. Um, and of course, they don't really have control over this. Uh, UE, the way things are geographically set up with a mountain range uh, over to the next country, Oman has tended sometimes to get the brunt because um, the rain causes flash floods in old riverbeds, which have now dried up, and flash floods. Uh, people do a lot of camping in the desert, so a lot of people end up dying from this. And they, you know, they have enough control to seed the clouds, but like, once that happens, the clouds kind of do what they want to. Um, the last thing I want to say about maybe the Mars probe is, uh, 
Yes, as a, at the series of launch events, um, which we were announcing and promoting the project, um, the spokespeople took this as a way of characterizing the UAE, picking up the, basically the torch of the ill-fated Lebanese space program of the 60s and also of the golden age of Islam. Um, and in this, it feels like very much an extension of the governmental cultural strategy, which I think of as uh, weaponized first-person plurals, basically creating a we where there never was a we. Um, so an example of this maybe is the aggressive collection of works which were looted from earlier Iraq and now Syria, or 3D printing monuments and artifacts that are destroyed by ISIS. And you have this situation where UE and Qatar are competing to essentially write themselves into and become guardians of this civilizational um, narrative that they were both never a part of and maybe sometimes exclu ex uh, explicitly excluded from. And back on Earth, of course, the UAE is uh, building a prototype Mars simulation city to very explicitly research colonization on Mars uh, for when they get there. Um, so thus far, the UAE space program is in its earliest stages, although it can be assumed that extending the country's uh, Siage, the like sent throw into space, will work GDP wonders as it did the aggressive funding of passenger transit, cargo and shipping infrastructure. And it's a case where um, a lot of people never stop in Dubai, but they you probably move through it and over decades they've kind of managed to refashion um, airline flight architecture that it's the way you have to move through it. Um, so this really, the space program, you can see it as a continuation of Sheikh Rashid's legacy, which saw the UAE become a trading powerhouse with the opening of the port in 1972, and then a bigger port, uh, Jebel Ali port, which was the first thing that was visible from space, um, kind of precursor of the continent and palm-shaped islands. You see one of them here. Also a reminder, Dubai quite literally has islands uh, shaped in the world, and it's very much a city that is not viewed um, is meant to be viewed by, it's like a city built for drone's eye view, especially more recently, um, as well as for satellite imagery. Um, so, and this was followed up by, um, okay. Um, so this is, um, sorry. So as with its labor force, this is very much a country that's set up to, that doesn't want anything to stay except its citizens. It's designed for everything and everyone to pass through. Um, and it's also really worth remembering that the image of the country is very much an iceberg type of situation where what you see is maybe like just a little bit above water. The bulk of the city is still a series of warehouses. The city functions as a free port um, and yeah, just a general um, series of warehouses. Um, so if, so if Sheikh Mohammed's cont contribution was a remaking of the city into an aerotropolis, um, dominating this space market is the next step. Uh, you know, and I should have another section, but I think I'm gonna end here because it's, I think we're getting late on time, but uh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Is there a kind of policy, state policy towards culture? Um, and how would you describe it? Is there also money in it, state money, or is it only private money? How uh, is the idea of the rulers of the uh, uh, UA, for example? I would say that each, uh, each, I've been talking mostly about Dubai and also I want to say that I'm wary of collapsing everything. Dubai is a good example because it maybe is an accelerated version, really accelerated version of what's happening uh, elsewhere in the Gulf. And you really feel this when you go to other places like uh, Bahrain or Kuwait or Qatar. It feels like Dubai did the 90s and the 2000s. And I think the same thing will happen just uh, faster. So Dubai is entirely market driven. Um, there's really no money almost from the government. Uh, they give money to the art fair, and that's kind of it, Art Dubai, that is. Um, the neighboring cities, and when we talk about the art scene, I'm really talking about the country as a whole. The neighboring cities of Sharjah um, and Abu Dhabi, both are heavily government funded. Um, so Sharjah tends to be one country, one institution that 
uh, you see the Sharjah Art Foundation and the Biennial, which is run by the royals, and it's very much a one family uh, culture thing, and they do really good work. I think Abu Dhabi, may, Abu Dhabi has, the capital city has a lot more money. Um, their strategy has generally been to, it's a strategy of state building, so they fund, they give a lot of money explicitly to young Emirati artists, and with the kind of it's, all, it's the kind of thing you see where um, you're seeing artists put on an international stage, uh, which is, again, done by uh, Abu Dhabi in a way, sometimes when they're not necessarily ready, but because they're Emirati and it's important to have an Emirati to represent the country. So you see this sometimes, like artists being sent to Venice when, you know, when they've recently come out of their MFA program, which is really not something you'd see elsewhere uh, in the world. So... And just to speak, the Abu Dhabi strategy has generally been one of importing brands, uh, kind of which they believe or trust. So the Guggenheim, which will probably never be built, uh, I think, is one of them. But there's also the Louvre. There's also the Sorbonne. Uh, and I would say France, while people are talking a lot about other countries, France, France's engagement, like they think the Sorbonne opened, it's probably been, I don't know, 15 years. It's been a long time. Um, a lot of this stuff has been happening more quietly until in the last few weeks. So yeah, I would, and also the British, well, they were supposed to build a national museum with the British Museum, but it also, that took too long. So the project has now been canceled or will be re, redone without the help of the British Museum and the branding. But uh, yeah, if that answers you. Mm -hmm. come out. Um, the image making that um, is really captured in that picture you showed us of the frame, uh -huh. um, I'm wondering about the, also what you're talking about um, with Dubai as being market driven. Um, I'm wondering if that's, because um, I'm also thinking about New York, uh -huh. and I'm wondering if this um, market driven and commodified position that the artists in the UE are in, but also the city itself mm -hmm. is in, is uh, dampening or does something uh, like lowers the position of the artists or the role of art in society in some way. I don't know um, if you, mm -hmm like maybe the spirit of it or something like this? I would say um, contrarily maybe because there is no government fund. So there's government funding for, government money goes towards building, as it does elsewhere in the UAE, beautiful big buildings. The government money goes towards institutions. There is almost no support directly given to artists. Um, UAE, Dubai is an extremely expensive city. It's hard to survive. You can't be there without, unless you're a citizen, in which case you have other access and privileges. You can't be there without, an, uh, without a visa. It's very difficult to afford the rent. So most artists have one to two other jobs. Um, so what little the market has done for artists, which is not very much, I think, has to make it viable for really the first time for artists to um, exist and to work as artists and maybe even move towards working, in some cases, full time as artists. Uh, I will say also, I think this is the last section I didn't get into on the free ports is um, Dubai really benefited from the Arab Spring, um, in part because all of the elites of the other countries in the region who did have protests, um, what the UAE did as soon as Arab Spring started was to essentially give its citizens money and be like, hey, don't protest, you know, and that worked. And obviously it sent its forces to very brutally suppress the protests in nearby countries like uh, Bahrain. But um, what happened, and really the around the time of uh, Arab Spring is when the art scene, the market exploded, it's because elites were moving their money into s storing it, as you see elsewhere, you know, with Freeport, storing it in paintings, you'll see this with the auction record of, you'll see a parallel rise and explosion of interest in, um, in the Arab modernists, which basically people were buying, you can see this with their auction records, uh, I'm getting uh, unclear, but basically people were um, storing their money in art and that's one thing that really made the scene explode. 
uh, in an inflated way, but I think it's only helped artists in that sense because there's no support. There's a residency now. Now there's maybe two residencies, and those are very, very new in the last two years or so. Um, and even that, gens the residencies tend to go to international artists to come and make work. There is no support for artists, really. If that answers your question. I will, I will say also, actually, these conditions mean that artists can't really, uh, there's no project spaces, for example, or very few. It's just, it's, it does privilege, a, I think you're right, it does privilege a certain kind of work, um, which is not necessarily commercial work so much as biennial, like biennial type uh, research-based practices, maybe. Um, but you don't see, you, it, do, it does definitely change the kind of work I think the artists produce just because there isn't the opportunity to do the other stuff, um, unless you have a lot of money already, which most artists obviously don't. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think Sharjah Pioneer has, or the Sharjah Foundation has created some, some added something to the contemporary art scene? Yeah, I think the Sharjah Foundation has really been the biggest drive, like really, absolutely. The quality is much, I think the quality of work is much higher. It's because it's one family, they have a dedication. There's a lot of problems with Sharjah, absolutely. Um, but because the family has a long-term dedication to it, which you don't see, again, it's Dubai vagaries of market, Abu Dhabi changes its mind, you know, and we like, let's fund something else. Um, I think the most important thing for the art scene has been absolutely the foundation and the biennial over the years, yeah. I think what they've added is uh, they do, on a younger level, they, um, there's not that much of arts education. There is more recently, but um, I think for someone growing up in the country now, they have a lot of uh, educational and public program. They have a very, very robust public programming, and I think for the, for the average citizen, I think art is much more, especially in Sharjah, art is much more integrated into their lives than it is in uh, a place like Dubai. Um, they, I, there's not, there's just not a lot of support. They, I think they have support for early career artists, maybe, but again, like a younger or more emerging artist, there's just not very much. But once you reach a certain level, like Sharjah will give them a lot of exposure and money, and there's fairly generous production grants, but again, this comes a little further into people's careers, I think. I think I think so. I mean, also call it tends it tends to be a seasonal thing. So the summer, where people it's very hot. You know, it's like even like even right now it's like the early forties Celsius. Um, people don't generally come, so it kind of I think it dedicates its summers to so local artists get a residency in the summer. Um, also call I think does actually does more than Sharjah in the sense for younger artists. I think there's a little bit of a it's 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 branding like they want the idea more recently of a homegrown art scene. So we'll give artists, uh, they do it through commissions, through the residency, through grants sometimes, and just because they're landlords essentially, they will give, when they have an empty warehouse, they will give it sometimes to an artist as a studio. That's the thing, artists can't, just can't afford to have studios because of the expensive. Uh, but even if they are not giving anything, mm -hmm. they are just showing. Mm -hmm. They also yeah, they also show the artists, they also, a lot of the uh, younger um, student work is shown in El Circal. It tends to, and I would say like it tends to be at different times of the year. Um, the season, which is like September through to let's say April, it tends to focus on international artists and the rest of the year they do do a lot, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much. I would say uh, uh, there is no uh, um, 
there are no other questions. I would suggest uh, tonight for those who still have some energy uh, to go to the Künstlerhaus because at 9 uh, p.m. there is uh, the uh, Sunset Kino of the uh, Kunstverein and uh, they show films which are chosen by Cameron Jamie, who is also a teacher at the Summer Academy right now. And for those who are kind of full with all uh, visual uh, impact, they can also uh, drink water or a beer or whatever there. So, Rahel, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was great having you here. Thank you. <laughs>